Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I want to congratulate you on your hard work on this uh, chairwoman's mark. Before I do, I certainly want to uh, reciprocate your generous remarks. Uh, I have enjoyed our partnership over the last six years and our friendship, which uh, uh, will last uh, well into the future, I'm sure, whatever our temporary differences are. You know, uh, in the five years before you and I uh, became chair and ranking member, roles which we swapped back and forth, uh, this bill never got out of this committee and never got across the floor of Congress. The six years that we've worked together, got out of this committee every single time and across the floor every single time. And in each of those occasions, we both voted for final passage of the bill, regardless of who the chairman was, regardless of what party was in power, regardless of who the president of the United States was. I think that is an enviable record. Could not have happened without you. Uh, your cooperation, your expertise, nobody knows this bill better. I don't think anybody in Congress cares about this bill more. And so I look forward to uh, working with you uh, as we go through this process. As I said on uh, Monday, I also want to thank you for incorporating so many of our shared priorities into this bill. You and I agree on the need for continued investment in biomedical research, public health infrastructure, and preparing the nation for the next pandemic. In fact, I actually support the President's higher request for the NIH, and I hope we can work together to achieve his recommended level. Uh, you and I also agree on the importance of funding special education and programs like TRIO and Gear Up, which help first-generation students complete college and change the trajectory of their lives. Thank you for recognizing the importance of these shared priorities. You've also been fair in including community project funding requested by the members on both sides of the aisle, bringing uh, some control of this funding back into the hands of elected representatives is not without its challenges this year. Uh, but you've uh, more than uh, met those challenges, and you've been fair and accommodating to both sides. And for that, uh, I thank you very, very much. Despite uh, our many areas of agreement, however, I'll be opposing the bill presented today. At the end of May, President uh, Biden sent a $6 trillion budget request to Congress for fiscal year 2022. The bill presented today mirrors the request closely. Proposing the highest spending levels since World War II, the price tag alone is utterly unrealistic. And while Congress uh, holds the purse strings and is ultimately responsible for providing the annual funding for the federal government, the President's budget request reveals his own radical priorities and, frankly, uh, his disregard for fiscal responsibility. First, instead of focusing on the urgent priorities for all Americans, President Biden's budget request elevates controversial policies over pressing needs, like strengthening our national defense and bolstering the tools to address and manage the crisis at our southern border. In fact, the budget uh, calls for uh, billions of dollars uh, in progressive policies like Medicare for All, Green New Deal, and those outlined in the so-called American Jobs Plan and American Families Plan, while recommending an effective cut in the funding for our military. With China and Russia growing their militaries by the day, such a move is misguided, to say the least. Beyond shortchanging our defense and spending big on progressive policies, President Biden expects the American people to foot the bill. His budget proposes a $55 trillion tax increase on American individuals and businesses over the next decade. Moreover, the President endorsed raising the corporate income tax rate and other taxes targeting individuals, small businesses, and our independent energy industries. Despite promises made during the campaign trail not to raise taxes on those uh, with low and middle incomes, the President's budget would also allow existing tax cuts to expire, which would immediately increase the tax burden on hardworking Americans. As individuals, families, and small businesses continue to recover from the coronavirus pandemic, such levels of unprecedented spending and taxation would only lead to inflation, slowed economic growth, and the highest national debt level in American history. Finally, most egregious in the President's budget request, which I was very disappointed to see reflected in the bill presented today, is the removal of the Hyde Amendment, which protects life and prevents federal taxpayer-funded abortions. Since it was first enacted in 1976, 45 years ago, 
Uh, it's estimated that this provision has saved more than 2 million lives while protecting the conscience right of the great majority of Americans who are opposed to publicly funded abortions for religious, moral, or fiscal reasons. Even when President Biden was serving in the United States Senate, he then expressed his support for the inclusion of the Hyde Amendment in appropriations bills and showed support for that inclusion as recently as two years ago while campaigning for president. Moreover, it's been supported by lawmakers, including every member sitting in this room today and signed into law by presidents of both parties every year as part of the appropriations bills. Madam Chair, you know the Democrats in Congress do not have the majorities capable of passing this bill uh, on their own. In the days and weeks ahead, it's my hope that members on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers can negotiate spending that is responsible and will not lead to uh, financial disaster. But the first step toward negotiation will be the full reinstatement of the Hyde Amendment, including conscience protection language added 16 years ago that has also been removed from this bill, even though the President supports that language. That provision protects American doctors nurses, and other health care professionals from participating in an abortion if they have a moral objection. This is an essential right of every American, and its removal is a danger to us all. Again, I want to point out that even President Biden's budget did not propose removal of this important language, first authorized by then-Representative David Weldon in 2005. These protections need to be reinstated in the, if the bill is to move forward. Quite frankly, uh, everybody in this room knows the bill will never pass the United States Senate without the inclusion of the Hyde and Weldon Amendments, and the majority of the American people support that view. In closing, while the bill does many good things, and while I certainly appreciate the openness the, of the process in which the Chair has uh, approached the development of the mark, I will be opposing the bill today. The price tag is too high. The bill contains many poison pill policy writers um, and, it, uh, and many unauthorized programs, um, and it bows to a leftist agenda that is out of step with the values of the American people. I would uh, like to emphasize again that even if all these issues were addressed today, removal of language that protects the lives of unborn American children and the rights of all Americans to freely exercise their conscience uh, with respect to abortion, assures that the bill, as written, will never reach the President's desk. This decades-old bipartisan compromise must be included before we negotiate on spending levels and other policy. It's just that simple. Again, I want to thank the Chair, the General Lady, and her staff uh, for all the hard work, and I do pledge to work with you in good faith, as we have so many years before, working together. Again, you and I have passed this bill through the Congresses, under both parties, a variety of presidents, and we've avoided a continuing resolution time and time again. It's my sincere hope that we will be able to accomplish that again, Madam Chair, and with that, I yield back my time.